it is being recorded, everybody. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Um, yeah, where to start? Um, I haven't I haven't been there in a while. I was I was coming about twice a year there for uh, I don't know three four years. Uh, really love New Zealand. It is funny. My uh, I'm sure the last thing you guys want is uh, more expat Americans. But uh, my wife and I were were participating in one of those you know games you know like a couples games and it said you know if you had to if you had to live somewhere other than where you live today where would you choose? And I wrote down New Zealand and I thought, oh man, she, she's not going to put that. And then of course we flip our cards over and she had the same thing. And um, we just, we just love it there. Uh, it's such an amazing culture, beautiful countryside, uh, incredible opportunity for agriculture. Uh, my whole career, I've focused on how to create new and stronger value streams for farmers. And I think there's so much opportunity in New Zealand uh, to sell higher on the hog, as we say, and, and, uh, and not, not focus, you know, so, so much on just production and raw material exports, but, but how do you get more value in the farmer's pocket? And so what we do at EOV and Land to Market is very much focused on those things, a huge part of the driver of what we're trying to create. So uh, super excited to be here with you all and, and, and talk a little bit more about it. Um, you, where, where do we want to dive in first? What uh, what makes the most sense? Well, I think, I think maybe we just have a, a little bit of background as to what land and market is, where it fits within savory and what and how that sort of links back to rangeland management. Probably just a little bit of housekeeping. If you know if anybody's got any any questions, they can either bang it in the chat or the Q&A and I'll try and deal with that or make sure that we bring it to Chris's attention. And um, but uh, I think, yeah, we just kind of where it fits in by way of background, how you how that's kind of come about, why land and market was thought to be necessary in this space, um, and then maybe start to contextualize that a little bit in terms of totally. you know, where this could fit for, for, for the Kiwi land. And the bed's yep, always no, I love it. The board, bed's already made up for you guys when you're ready. So <laughs> as, as soon as your border agents will let us in, I'm there. <laughs> but uh, that, that's not available at the moment. Um, yeah, no, that's a great place to start. So for those that aren't familiar, the Savory Institute uh, is part of a movement called holistic management that's been around for the last 50 years. Uh, it's a triple bottom line proactive planning pr process uh, that, that allows you to upgrade your grazing management for your context. The key to it, no one's going to tell you how to farm. No one's going to tell you how often to move your animals. No one's going to tell you what your density should be. It's a, just a tool to optimize inside of your context in the eco region that you're operating in. So we've been doing that for 50 years, the principles-based design uh, all around the globe. And about 15 years ago, we, we started opening up, um, we kind of colloquially call them field offices, but savory hubs. These are locally led and managed. These are people that take our uh, process, our IP, our services, our programs, and they contextualize them to a given region. So Ata is the hub in New Zealand, Hugh is the uh, hub leader. Uh, and so now we've got a perennial presence that's locally led and managed to work with farmers and ranchers in that given region. Uh, so that's, that's the whole management side. Uh, it's a non-prescriptive approach. Like I said, it's about just finding balance through the complexity of all the different variables we deal with in our lives. Uh, about the same time that we got the hub process up and running, we had brands coming to us saying, okay, you're, you're been training people over the last 50 years on all six continents. Uh, you're getting these regenerative outcomes. You're doing university studies uh, and other research projects. How can we start to engage with those producers? We thought, you know, mostly what we do is, is training people. It's a context-based approach. They're not doing it the same way everywhere. There's no silver bullet in this. It's so funny to me that we get that in other complex scenarios like finance, but as soon as it gets to agriculture, everybody wants the recipe, the silver bullet that's going to work everywhere, all places, all the time. The punchline is there isn't one. Everyone has to do it their way for what makes sense for their broader context, and not just the context of their land, but the context of their livelihoods, who are the decision makers, what's the status of their financial situation, what's the kind of quality of life that they want. There's going to be variables there that, that aren't taken into account. So while the world is rushing for the recipe that creates net positive results, I don't think we're going to find one. And so people are saying, okay, so can we just vouch for these farmers because they've had training? 
and we said, you know, that I think we're at a place where the world is ready to go beyond a, a practice-based proxy style certification. If the market is really interested in this story, we should go and measure outcomes. So we spent six years developing a scientific protocol called ecological outcome verification. I think I've already said it once, we say EOV for short. And it's measuring the outcomes of what happens on the land as an aggregate of ecosystem health. So we're not looking at one single variable, like you know, right now carbon is the gateway drug. It's the most popular. It's, it's also the one that is the uh, hardest to measure, most expensive to measure and is a new frontier for uh, the scientific community. So it's, it's not a great proxy for environmental health I understand why it's important in no way is there any climate denying that's happening in it. it is a challenging one to measure we wanted to go out and measure outcomes of what's happening on the land across a spectrum of ecosystem health so we look at things like carbon sequestration soil organic matter soil water holding capacity and water infiltration rates biodiversity and ecosystem function as a whole that's that's the broad metrics of what we look at on the land so it took us six years to develop a protocol that would work across the globe, across eco regions, build the, the procedures to normalize that for changes year over year to things like weather uh, and roll that out to where you could really start talking apples to apples between what's happening in a, a more non-brittle environment like most of New Zealand versus a brittle environment like most of Australia uh, and really make those, those speak the same language. Uh, so it took, took a long time. Also, we had to look at how to deploy this methodology throughout the world, sometimes most world and sometimes the poorer regions of the world. So bringing out a, a, a backhoe to the middle of Mongolia to do a soil pit probably wasn't going to work or certain drone technologies with, with LIDAR and infrared weren't going to work. So we had to create something that was deployable and then we can add data sets to that where it makes sense, but you needed that baseline methodology. So that's what we developed, ecological outcome verification. We've now deployed that method on over 800,000 hectares globally, 2 million acres uh, plus creeping up to, to two and a half million acres right now uh, on all six habitable continents. And that's growing in spite of the pandemic, it has continued to grow. Uh, and New Zealand is a hotspot for this process. This is something that, uh, has been a huge, huge area of expansion. And so Land to Market then, which is the program that I co-lead, picks up from the farm gate forward. After we have uh, verified metrics of what's happening on farm, we're accounting for those ecosystem services. We then pick up from the farm gate forward, plug in with brands, help brands source from producers that are doing the right thing. Their stewardship is creating net positive results to get the target off livestock's back. That's a huge component of it that the general zeitgeist in the world is saying that livestock products are bad. They're always bad. And we look at it and say, these animals are on this planet for a reason. And when we're managing a landscape to be like a, like a grassland, there's a huge synergy between grasslands and grazers. And we want to exploit that synergy. But right now the world's not open to that dialogue. So by having an empirical based outcome methodology, we can go and take that dialogue to the next level and say, there's actually a delineation here. We're not arguing that there isn't a bad form of livestock production and it does make up too much of the world's production when it comes to meat, but there is a nature-based version that mimics nature, that takes a proactive approach, that gets these net positive outcomes. And we wanna be able to pull those two apart and explain that to the world better. So. Land to market works predominantly with brands to make that connection between shared values from the farmer and the consumers. Everybody wants clean air, clean water, more wildlife, more biodiversity. Uh, farmers strive for that. We know how hard farmers work for that uh, and consumers want that. And there's very little narrative arc and connection between those two. So by having this outcome-based methodology, we can figure out what happens on the farm and then connect that to the various global value chains to help differentiate that in the marketplace using forward-facing brands and the, um, the more progressive brands that wanna create change that understand this is the way the world is moving and see the value in being a first mover to take products to market that are fully differentiated from the farm forward. So that's probably a good stopping point. I'll pause there and we continue the dialogue. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. Thank in a nutshell what we're doing. Thanks, Chris. That's a, that's a pretty big mouthful. That's an awful lot to take on, but uh, I think it, it, it connects and links an awful lot of things. It, it's useful just to know the background. 
I guess the other point though, uh, I know, so land and market really tends to be around about a consumer face, but I know that a couple of the other object objectives that kind of sit in there is this uh, full carcass utilization, bringing together you know, consumers and brands who used to work in isolation and silos and actually look at how we can more efficiently utilize but also the opportunity to bring better returns back to back to the producers and shorten those supply chains. So those opportunities grow for those producers. Totally. Yeah. So for the brand perspective, some of this will relate to their size. Some of it's just their individual makeup. There's really two main drivers. One is to take it more consumer facing. Uh, the world is opening up to this notion of a stronger food and fiber democracy where we're really for all of human history the marketplace has given the consumers the least amount of information to close the sale. And now we're in a place that as we have more distributed democracies around the globe, even on social issues, consumers say, no, we want to deserve to know more. And so they're, they're saying, these are the things we value. What can you do to deliver on them? And so that's sending signals in mass in a way that's never happened before from the grassroots. So that's, that's super exciting. The other side of that is, is this world of impact accounting Brands are realizing that in the future, they're probably going to have to pay more of their true cost to society, even if it's further back in their value chain into, you know, what's sometimes called scope two or scope three, further back into their value chain of stuff they don't even control. So it might be a processor that they buy from. Um, the world is basically saying, no, finish brand, you're the, going to be the one that's held accountable for what you did, the one that's in the marketplace. So we're gonna give you, you know, an array of, of what we say sticks and carrots of, of penalties and benefits um, that if you do the right thing, you'll get benefits. And if you do the wrong thing, you'll, you'll get penalties. Um, the finance market is supporting that in mass as well. So we're seeing over and over again that everybody from venture capital to hedge funds, the entire equity space really is recognizing that when there's volatility at raw material sourcing for a brand, which is just their fancy way of saying farms. When they buy from farms and there's volatility there, predominantly from climate change, that that volatility ripples its way through the supply chain into the actual resilience of that business itself. And that makes it more volatile for them to hold it in their portfolio. So now we've got the investment space saying, if, if you don't have a more resilient supply chain that starts all the way with farms, we're not going to invest in you, or we might divest from you. Um, and that's okay. It tends to be your bigger brands that on that front. Uh, so they're saying, okay, we we need to make change. So that's that's a big driver right now that didn't exist even 24 months ago. Two years ago, that space was much more immature. It's a lot more conversational, uh, and now it's much more of a reality that we're seeing those signals be very strong. The next step after that will be ESG compliance from governments that they actually put a little bit more teeth. Right now, it's it's predominantly a benefit space, you know, base space. That when we get one step further, there will be some more penalties coming from governments for brands that don't hit targets and don't help them roll up to hit their bigger uh, objectives that they set it, like the Paris climate talks and the COP events that happen year over year. So that's, that's the brand side. The whole animal utility side is probably my favorite. That's my background is how do we utilize all the parts and pieces of the animal? So again, just a couple short years ago, hardly anybody out there had ever been paid for their hides. Farmers weren't getting paid for their hides. So you, you, you grow this beautiful animal, you spend a few years on it and you've got tons of people that want the middle meat. So they're gonna take all the steaks and chops, the front and the back's a little harder to sell. And then you start to get into the non-edibles, the offal, the hide, and the abattoir takes that, God knows where it goes, it goes somewhere. And a lot of times you pay a disposal fee for those things. It's not, it's not considered an asset, it's a liability. And so we started going to brands that were looking for better quality products, but they were looking for those ones that we don't normally get paid for. So. Predominantly, that's going to be in the leather market and in uh, non-edibles like pet food, where they're still utilizing that product. They might render it in some way and then feed it to Fifi and Fido, you know, to, to, to cats and dogs predominantly. And so we realize they have the same impact goals. They have the same desire to align with their consumers on shared values. Uh, and, and they're wanting to do better with sourcing. 
but there was a lot of kind of murkiness intentionally that had merged in the supply chain over years to keep them separate from who those producers were. So we started creating linkages between the farmers and those, those buyers that buy the rest of the animal, the rest of the products. And then we started getting brands together in the same room where you have a meat buyer, you have a skins buyer, and you have a pet food buyer all in the same space. And they realized organically very quickly, they buy from the same farms, they sell to the same consumers, and they never talk to each other. They don't go to the same conferences, they don't go to the same events, they don't trade people uh, across industry. And so we started this process of, of what we call cross-sector collaboration, of getting brands to work together. It's worked out really well. Uh, the brands share resources, creating transparency and traceability to reach further back to farm. Because they're in different sectors, they don't have to worry about things like antitrust or collusion. Uh, they're buying different parts of pieces of the animal. And, and then we're constantly pushing on them to say, not just premiums, create new value streams for the farms. So in the last two years, for the first time in history, at least as well as I'm aware, we had a brand that the first one was actually Timberland, a VF Corp company. Um, the closest VF company to you guys is, is Icebreaker up in Auckland. Uh, so in that same family of brands, Timberland known for uh, their work boots and uh, leather belts and things like that, they started sourcing direct from farms and paying the farmers uh, a, a, a fee for their hides, which had never been done before. So they were actually sending a feedback loop past the abattoir and paying the farmers for having uh, hides that come from verified regenerative landscapes through land to market backed by this ecological outcome verification. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff that we're doing more and more of. They now have entered into a partnership with uh, Applegate, which is a US-based lunch meat company. You can look them up, Applegate Meats, uh, but they're owned by Hormel, another, another one of the world globals. And they're now partnered together uh, all over the world, sourcing meat and hides together and we're working on bringing in a pet buyer that's going to do the same thing. Uh, so they can continue to just not just do it as a one-off, but go and take this all around the globe and create these new value streams and premiums concurrently for farmers. Now, Chris, just um, yeah, that's that's really good insight. And start you started to touch on some of the you know the global brands that are starting to get involved. But you want to just talk a little bit about uh, you know, I know you guys have been stretched pretty big time because you're getting so much, so much inquiry. So the uptake, you know, the people who are now jumping on board at, at all levels, both the global brands, but also the, the small producers and how, how some of that's kind of fitting together. Yeah, the, the growth has been um, exponential and, and totally a surprise. Um, I think three years ago, we had five or six brand partners that we operated with predominantly in a pilot mode of let's let's launch some capsule lines, let's get some flow through, let's see if we can do this. Uh, we ended last year with 31 partners. Uh, our brands pay in a membership basis and, and it's a little bit like not just market differentiation like a certification, but they actually want a full consulting package that goes with that. So it's, it's pretty high touch what we do with brands. We ended the year with 31 partners. Our goal was to do about 20 to 30% growth over the next year. Uh, we surpassed that in the first quarter. We now have 56, 57 brand partners with about a new brand partner coming on each week. The, um, the team has exploded to meet that. So uh, this has predominantly been a small program that's run by two to three people that focus on it day in and day out, plus the broader resources of the Savory Institute and the Savory Network through our hubs. Uh, we now have nine, 10 people fully dedicated to working on land to market, and that's continuing to grow as well. Um, so our team has been growing uh, tremendously. A huge unlock in that is we started this working with the larger brands because there's a, a huge play for this impact accounting. But then as we got bigger, we were able to remove some of those barriers of entry for smaller brands. So now a lot of our brands are, are startups or mid-sized companies. They're much more nimble, uh, much more, uh, much less risk averse, uh, much more connected to the brands with their consumers on shared values. And so we brought in uh, a lot more smaller brands over the last year. So a lot of regional brands are coming on board uh, and we continue to engage with brands in New Zealand on that front. We'll see how that goes. I know New Zealand, you really can't have an unlock until uh, the export markets are there, but I think there is opportunity to do more 
intra in the country, uh, moving from the countryside into the big cities uh, and getting product differentiated that way. But it's, it's a both and, but we can't forget about the export piece, but I think there is opportunity to do some local domestic stuff as well. Yeah, we can keen to explore that a little bit, Chris. I mean, as as you know, I mean, we're looking to try and create a whole lot. You know, the series of this this webinar, and we're going to be having a few others um, across different elements of of the land and market program. But it, we're looking to uh, start to create more momentum and impact around what can happen in New Zealand. We've got uh, some guys who are doing already looking at getting you know, who, who come on board with EAV already looking to get produce into local market, but also then ultimately into an export market. Obviously, 90% of our product is roughly going into that export market. So it always becomes a big part of our focus. But I think the domestic part of that is really overlooked. Um, and uh, so part of our strategy over the course of the next few months also in creating this awareness is, is to try and get some of that product into the marketplace, create that awareness, and hopefully then leverage off that kind of momentum while, while we continue to try and crack this this export kind of approach. So, um, I mean, with you, uh, it's it's timely because um, New Zealand farmers tend to be a little bit sit on their hands and don't, you know, they take they take a lot of shit, but they don't they don't sort of can, tend to react to it. Um, whereas actually, we've had one of our biggest uh, protest days last Friday, where um, um, farmers got out all all across the country in their utes and their tractors and sort of said, "Hey, hey, guys, we we've been pushed around enough. It's time." It's time that we need to start pushing back. So, uh, you know, it'd be, be quite good maybe just to explore how that could work for New Zealand, how you would see some of that kind of fitting together and particularly what, you know, what land to market can bring and uh, is that opportunity. Yeah, I think that in a lot of ways, what I've experienced in New Zealand is, is more ripe than anywhere else. Even though the focus has been on export, the culture of, of people in your big cities in Auckland, Christchurch, Wellington, the the type of food outlets that you guys have, uh, it's just incredible. I mean, I think you've got a very receptive demographic. Everybody seems, by and large, uh, you know, one or two generations removed from farming. They they value it by and large. And I know there's always tension between urban and rural, but. I see less of that there than I do in the rest of the world, uh, much more receptive than, than uh, like Europe to have people in cities really understand what's happening on farms and really value it, not just for their urban values, but for the values of the farmers as well. Um, and the food culture is just incredible. I, I think some of the best food I get in the world is in New Zealand. It's what I dream that we could have here in, in California to have those localized supply chains, the little cafes and things that are popping up, um, the upscale diners that are not, they're not so pretentious that it's, you know, Parisian, <laughs> but you know, it's good quality food served upscale. There's tons of opportunity for that. And then I see, you know, what's happening in Auckland around um, digital platforms and more direct a door, you know, I, I've said my whole career, there's a reason they call it fast food and not cheap food because convenience is king with the consumer. And so the more that we can get things to them, direct to their door, into their household, automated, uh, we're seeing all around the world a big uptake for that. I, I think that in some ways it erodes a little bit of culture, but as long as we can get people still cooking, it's a good, it's, it's probably still a good thing because uh, most of the world is moving more and more away from that. So if we can get ingredients into their house and then even prepared foods, I'm seeing more and more heat and serve. And I think that's just where we have to meet consumers where they're at. I see a lot of opportunity for that in New Zealand. So while I get the, that you have way more animals than you have people and there's lots of reasons to focus on those export markets, I think there's still a lot of opportunity to saturate the local markets as well to get more margin on those products uh, and really connect with a very receptive consumer base on those shared values coming from local farms in the country. Uh, and I've seen some of that, but I think there's room for a lot more. And I think it's, it's, it's worth acknowledging the added value of that compared to export markets. So that's what I've did my whole career in California was getting product from farms. It's very similar to New Zealand in a lot of ways, very, very rural parts of the state. Um, it's very different quality of living to then go to the cities where it's, it's, it's really like a different world and creating that flow through of shared values and relationships 
with people in those more urban and suburban environments and getting them products to the farm and then creating experiences in the farm, get people back out to it and create deeper feedback loops. I think there's tons of opportunity for that in New Zealand, especially with the tourism market when that opens back up, tons of opportunity to um, have that really round out someone's experience of coming to a country that's so beautiful and, and noted for its environmental accords. Uh, th thanks for that, Chris. And, and uh, yeah, so I mean, I know, you know, there's been some quite, some quite cool stories with little producers, people who have started uh, getting, get into, you know, um, already shown some interest in how they can direct market to their local, yeah, I mean, one thing we don't have in New Zealand is a whole lot of people, which we, we obviously miss, we don't have a lot of people coming past our gates and things. But, you know, in the in the US, there's been some really good stories about uh, your know, farmers who have then started doing some of their own product, particularly in, in some of those small goods and, and um, you know, high value add kind of products, which are ultimately ended up rolling out into some kind of national products. I mean, you want to just talk about how some of those guys have worked and how they've made that brought that together. Yeah, I, I ran a place for uh, about 10 years that was 700 hectares. It had, um, it had uh, two to 300 hectares of 100 year old olive trees. We had about 20 hectares of apricots, 20 hectares of citrus, uh, and then a smattering of figs, pomegranates, persimmons, avocados. Long story short, we fresh picked fruit every day of the year. Uh, and then we had uh, some hay ground and then some rangier grounds in hill country uh, that we raised livestock on. We did beef, lamb, goat, chicken, uh, chicken for both meat and eggs. Uh, we direct marketed everything ourselves. We built a regional brand, uh, shelf stable products like dried fruit, jams, and olive oil. We sold nationally. Um, and then we created, uh, we went to eight farmers markets a week at our peak. We did uh, meat buying clubs. So we would go to urban areas and we would get uh, lorries to haul um, product on pallets to us down to buying clubs and we distribute everything in one day. So they call those farmers markets in reverse. You get all your orders in advance. You pack it up for each person. You show up, they hand you a check and you, you deliver a bunch of stuff to them. Uh, we partnered with a bunch of fruit and veg CSAs. Uh, so they would have meat and, and then use our uh, heirloom fruits to add into what their offerings were. Uh, we did a little bit of everything, you, you name it, we tried it. Uh, early on in like 2008, our e-channel, our website store was, was doing over a million dollars in sales just from local markets, uh, just from, from those, those outlets that I just mentioned. There's a lot of that happening in the States now. That farm that I'm with that had some, some stuff with family trust as does happen and it's not continuing to operate, but there's White Oak Pastures, there's Thousand Hills, there's Richard's Grass-Fed Beef. Um, ones that make it that far that you can think of, Hugh. Uh, rep provisions. Um, there's there's a number of them now that are really doing an amazing job of starting out with regional marketing, taking that out to national marketing. Uh, some even getting into international marketing at this point now. Uh, but they build a brand that consumers connect with. Uh, White Oak Pastures is probably the most notable on that front. Uh, they've been in New York Times, The Guardian. Um, uh, NPR, uh, Washington Post, you name it. They've, they've been in those outlets uh, for doing things differently. Uh, and so I think the world is really hungry for that story right now of people doing it right. And so if you can step into that story, add uh, additional data and output to that, uh, adds validity to that. But there's, there's tons of opportunity to connect again, just keep driving that home on shared values that, that currently the consumers don't feel that they've been connected with in the past. Chris, you, there was a, a comment on the uh, on the chat just about um, you know the relationship between the farmer and the, and, and how they get paid, the, how that transactional activity kind of works, and where EOV and land and market sit in that. Do you want to just talk a little bit about how that works? And and you know, um, land and market's not about setting fees or costs or whatever, but it's but how how that collaboration can work and how land and market adds, adds value to what it is the farmer's doing and and taking that right through to the consumer. Yep. Yep. We say a lot that we're match.com. We're not, we're not brokers. We're not aggregators. Um, we are building tools. We've got a platform in development right now that makes it easier for brands, whether big or small, to find the type of supply chain partners and farms that are delineating and segregating this product and making it available to them with full transparency and traceability back to farm in each of those supply chains. 
Uh, but we don't we don't broker product. We don't go to the farms and buy it and sell it. We largely stay out of price. Uh, but what we are trying to do is create uh, a better standard of living for farmers. The world is awakening right now in mass all across the, the, the world, all across all continents to this idea that the soil is the solution to the world's biggest problems, to climate change, to food insecurity, to water shortages, uh, to raging floods and fires, to struggling rural economies across the globe. They're realizing that soil and soil management is a central component to all of that. that if that's true, which we obviously believe it is, that really means the farmer is the ambassador to that solution. They're really our liaison as civilization as a whole to creating those outcomes that we want. And yet for all of human history, they've largely been relegated to the peasant class. That can't continue. If we're gonna see them as the solutionary, as the heroes to this story, we need to increase their quality of life and quality of living and resiliency at the same time. And so we need to restructure the way that business is done. We have a number of ideas on how to do that. Uh, first and foremost is new value streams, getting paid for things that used to be waste products. Premiums has been a strategy that's been around for a while. The problem I see in premiums is it's a, it's a short-term tool economically. As a program scales and it becomes more the way that business is done, those premiums wane and they start to decline. Uh, it's just basic supply and demand. So we see the, the real change, the real unlock happening around farmers getting paid for ecosystem services, both in, in voluntary markets in the court. Maybe you want to just explore a little bit what you mean by that? I think that was going to be my next question is how do we, yeah, again, I mean, one of one of the things that concerns us a little bit, just picking up on that side of it, is, is um, oh. you know, this whole concept of, of, of regenerative, which is becoming an, a misunderstood and people are sort of trying to abuse it really or, and own it in terms of marketing. So I guess what we started to try and do is talk less about that and more about how we're actually adding help to the ecosystem and the environment. And again, White Oak Pasture is a great example of how that's impacted both on the food they produce, the community around them, that whole that whole operation has been regenerated because of their principles that they've brought to that. But so maybe you can just you know, segue a little bit into that discussion around you know, beyond carbon, what other indicators that we want to be looking at in terms of ecosystem health. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a big epiphany for me when I started working with Caring Group. Caring Group is the parent company to Gucci, Balenciaga, Saint Laurent, you, you name it, the, the dozen of the most well-known luxury brands uh, in the world. And, and they're the, the parent, the holding court for that. And I started looking at a tool they use called environmental profit loss. It's a true cost accounting tool that measures impact across um, all sectors of their value chain and relates it back to what it costs for society to fix those things. If there was a true cost to actually mitigate damages that are being done to the environment to fix those, what would that cost? And then they try to make decisions based on the lowest cost to environmental impact. And I realized this is a brand that in luxury, they're, they're very understated. They're not, they're not going to, you know, we call it NASCAR, you know, you know, like racing where you have sponsors all over the vehicles. Luxury is not going to put all that stuff front and center. It's about understated performance that what they sell. So there was very little they talk about to their consumers on these shared values. But I realized they're putting a cost to what the environmental impact is and what it costs to clean things up. In the last seven to 10 years, a bunch of brands have come on board to that to say, what would it really cost to clean up damage that happens along our supply chain, which is starting to set an opportunity cost or a fixed value for the positive that farmers do. And so in that conversation with Caring, they showed where their biggest impact was, where most of their environmental costs, and it was these huge bubbles around raw material sourcing around farms. They said, this is where all the bad happens. And I said, what if you could prove that that was a positive number, that you had somebody farming the right way and they were getting net positive results? Could your system handle that? And they were like, no, we've only thought of what they call tier four raw material sourcing as the negative. And I said, being that that's a biological system, it can actually create abundance versus all the mechanical systems after that of processing and packaging and shipping and all those, none of those things are ever gonna be net positive, but a biological system can be net positive and you can actually offset some of those other things that happen in your processing chain. 
And that, that blew their minds. Now we see governments coming on board and they're starting to do the math on what floods and fires and these climactic disasters cost them going, wait a minute, what if we invested in people doing things right at the soil level first, could we offset some of that through a proactive mitigation strategy rather than a cleanup later strategy? You look at the trillions of dollars that are spent on worldwide disasters, floods and fires probably being the biggest, um, you're having government start to realize, okay, this is an untenable situation. We can't continue to pay for the cleanup. We, can, we need to start investing in a proactive solution. Again, this brings the farmer back front and center. So while there's been emerging markets for things like carbon offsets and now carbon insets, which is a little bit, it's basically just saying you're gonna, you're gonna buy products with a, for your value chain with better carbon scores attached to them. We're now starting to see the world wake up to, okay, wait, it needs to go beyond carbon. We need to understand water and biodiversity as well. Those are the main three pillars that are emerging now. And they're all actually different windows in the same room. They're different representations yeah. of good stewardship of the land. And so we're seeing this whole space kind of come together. Well, we already measure what's happening across an aggregate of ecosystem health, not because we knew those markets were going to emerge. We were hopeful they would, but because it helps the managers get feedback loops of what's working, how they can optimize their own management year over year on their land by seeing these outcomes, these leading indicators of what's happening from an ecosystem service standpoint. So all of that to say, the world is starting to put numerical values, financial values on a broader suite of what is called ecosystem services other than just carbon. So what's the benefit to society here? Can we put a, a number on that? What would it cost to clean up? Can we use positive to offset negative? All of this space is emerging, which to me, that's the strongest new value stream for farmers when you have brands and companies in the private sector that's gonna start paying for these voluntary markets to say, we're gonna offset what's happening in the rest of our value chain because it, it helps us with our financial backers, our revolving lines of credit, our equity partners, whatever it might be, we're going we're gonna to do that because it gives us value. It also allows us to align with consumers on shared values. And then next up, right behind that, you're going to have governments changing the way that they subsidize agriculture based on outcomes to society because they're not going to be able to afford to continue to pay the cleanup on these climactic disasters that are happening all around the world. Yeah, it's, it's pretty timely. We've just had some massive floods down here and then you see what's happening in Denmark and then you guys have got all these fires. And um, the, one of the things that we're finding is that from a government point of view, it's still pretty much a prescriptive approach. It's still pretty much saying that this is the way you're going to run your, manage your land and this is what... So do you see that leadership coming from the brands or the consumer? Do you, how And and so we're, and if that becomes an opportunity, and I, I'm sure it's going to be because you know we see that already around... Uh, the improvement and health of the ecosystem and the value of that. Um, who, you know, who's, who's actually going to pay for that and how does that get back through to the farmer? I still think the brands are right now the critical nexus and, and, and the logical next step. We got to a certain burgeoning or a critical mass around the globe and we really had two options. We can go deeper into policy or we can go deeper into markets. You don't have to be a rocket science to say the markets move exponentially faster than the policy space does. Uh, a lot of people miss this, but the basis of healthy democracies is that policy represents the will of the people. When they're healthy and operating correctly, that's how they, they should operate, which means that they're laggards. They're operating behind. They can't go from the top and control and say, you know, you're all not really there yet, but we really should do this. It's political suicide unless you're in a, a, a more authoritarian or dictator government, which the world is uh, obviously embracing in mass, which we should be worried about. But if we want to have democracies continue, we need to understand their lagging function. So the brands are gonna move quicker on what happens or the marketplace is gonna move quicker on, on what those values are, what those opportunities are. So we chose that pathway first. And I think we're gonna see more growth in that arena. We're gonna see it be by and large, less risk averse than policy. Policy has to wait till everything's you know, perfect is the enemy of good. Everything has to be perfectly buttoned up before we do it. And then we've already mucked it up before we started. The marketplace is all about test and learn. And so that space is much more open to this opportunity and saying, everything doesn't have to be perfect, but let's start making things move in the right direction, get some flow through, be iterative, 
and start to collectively shape the conversation around what proper compliance looks like for the next evolution and bring policymakers into that. So I think we're probably three to four years out from really pushing intentionally into global policy. I think there will probably be some pilot spaces that happen before that. Uh, and I think New Zealand could very much be a strong case for that. Uh, we've had a lot of receptivity in my trips there that have been in the past in Wellington of policymakers that, that really understand the value to position New Zealand, where right now miles to market has been a lot of how the world sees impact. We're trying to pull apart the nuance to that and say, actually, you're shipping product around the world on mass transit, which is probably the most efficient way to ship product. And if we can show the actual uh, ecosystem service outcomes of what's happening on the land, we can really have a much more informed, higher resolution discussion and pull that nuance apart in a way that, that probably benefits New Zealand pretty well. So, what, what, I mean, one of the things, I guess, that also comes up a little bit is about eating local, you know, re food security in local governments, local regions. Um, I see that's, you know, that's not something that's so powerful in New Zealand because we're so focused on this export thing, but I think it's a much bigger opportunity. So how do we tell that local story in, in such an export dependent kind of um, kind of producer base and 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 yeah, how does how you know, how's it going to work? I mean, I know there's resistance in the US, if you like, from buying produce from outside. They want to try and protect their own producers and things. So how does how does that um, how do you see that kind of being resolved as a conflict? Yeah, the local one is is so nuanced. You know, I, I, as I you know mentioned a minute ago, I spent a lot of my career developing local and regional um, you know, supply chains and really creating relational, I even hate, that's why I'm pausing that word, I hate those, such a transactional word, really connecting with consumers, building relationships, long-term um, connections that, that last. To me, local is so much more about culture and values than it is about impact. The impact one is way more complicated when you pull that apart. So here in the West Coast in the United States, uh, I have a, 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 a friend who owns a meat brand that in the spring and early summer, he gets all of his meat from here on the West Coast. In our winter, he's shipping product from New Zealand to come into his supply chain to offset the low of what we have. He did a life cycle assessment on that impact and realized that two trailer loads of cattle coming from Oregon to California was more impact, more carbon emitted than I think it was 10 or 20 container loads coming from New Zealand. Again, because that mass, that mass balance, that, that uh, the economies of scale, the efficiency that's happening in, you know, we all get it when we're putting people in a bus in a city or on a tram or on a subway. It's like, oh man, that's the most efficient way to do that. In global markets, it's like the miles the market is the only thing we look at doesn't matter if they're riding a bicycle or a super inefficient, you know, big diesel truck. Um, you know, it's all the same. And I know in the markets that we were in, there was lots of times we were running partial loads. We were only running full one way. Um, and there's all sorts of impact there. So it's, it's hard to pull the cultural piece apart from the impact piece. But it's so funny how the world, by and large, talks out of both sides of their mouth. We want more local, but we're urbanizing more than ever before. And I don't think society is really thinking through what is the footprint of this mass urbanization that we see around the globe? How much further do they have to reach if we were going to create um, truly local markets? You start to go from 100 miles to 500 to 1,000 miles, and then you deal with seasonality challenges. Can you really feed these populations? that are so disconnected from uh, their supporting environment? Probably not. So our program is wholly agnostic to, to globalization. Uh, if somebody, if a brand wants to focus on more domestic, wants to focus on more regional for their area, that's great. If they want to source for around the world, that's great. I just want them to go and get the right product. We talk a lot about um, the quality being the, the top focus not just the quality of the product, but the quality of the impact. And I think that's changing that conversation in a way that hasn't happened before. So local's a, local's a tricky one. I think it has its value. I'm, I'm, I've spent enough of my career on it to not throw that out, but it's a more nuanced discussion when it comes to impact. 
maybe the local thing, and, and I'd just like to pick up on that quality point that you were saying too, in terms of that quality audit or how, how land and market impacts or the culture of that quality, but also maybe it's more about uh, you know, the land to market tries to preserve the story of, of origin, where that comes from and telling the story of the, um, so whether it's again a global or a, a local kind of supply chain, is it, it's how we tell that story of where it comes from. Yeah, as, as, as society gets more urbanized, it also gets more ecologically illiterate. We, we live in the most ecologically illiterate society of all time on a, on a humanity scale, not, not one country or one continent, but around the world, people are getting more and more disconnected from the land that supports them. There's a craving there though. There's a desire. There's something I think primal in all of us that we know we're missing on that piece. And so that desire to connect back to the people that grow the food and fiber that supports us is stronger than ever before. And so I think farmers have a, a definite opportunity to take advantage of that, which is, which is probably not a great situation for society that we're, we're getting this less resilient consumer base that's more and more disconnected. But how do we make lemons into lemonade and, and take advantage of that and build those connections? I think we have a little bit of risk of it being kind of um, kitschy at the moment, you know, where you see a lot of this tourist stuff and it's a little bit trumped up and kind of uh, kind of manufactured experiences. I think we have a little bit of work to kind of cross it over the goal line of, of how do we celebrate it for what it is and what it isn't, you know, and really embrace all that, that regenerative agriculture is and, and, and still acknowledge that it's not bucolic paradise, that it's a lot of work. And this is generations of commitment to a land base that usually allow this to happen. Um, so there's a little bit of work to be done there, but the opportunity I still think is greater than that's, that's ever existed before. No, that's great. And uh, yeah, some great comments. I think we get, we're pretty much we bit of a late start, but we're getting back, we're getting up towards the top of the hour and people might need to move on and get on with their days. But any any kind of last words of advice for, for us as a bunch of Kiwis in terms of how we can roll this out and, and you know, we, we'll look forward to maybe having another more successful start of another webinar in a few weeks time. But um, uh, you know, I guess for us, it's it's really, you know, the exciting thing about EOV and land and market for me is is that it is is what it presents to New Zealand as an opportunity. How, it, as you said at the outset, how does it help us move? You know, we've I've been in agricultural industry in New Zealand now for probably longer than I like to admit. I think it's getting on over forty plus years. Um, it, right from the start, is, from when I started off as a veterinarian in the rural scene, I mean, you know, we were told that what we need to do is get up the value chain. And yet we're still so focused on commodification and a commodify and, and an ingredients base. And I'm not sure that we're getting closer to it, but I see land and market and EOV as that opportunity to move that needle. So um, any agreed. I, yeah, agreed. I, I think that you know one of the things I didn't didn't get a chance to mention, we don't operate in supply chains that utilize feedlots. Uh, I'm not interested in the discussion of good stewardship that happened at, at cow calf and out on the land offsetting what happens in feedlots. And so a lot of the chains that we're working with are grass-based dairies or um, more of that grass-fed meat, or maybe they're doing a little bit of, of creep feeding out in the fields, but it's part of the animals are out on the land. They're part of the grazing management. And so it, it whittles down the supply base that we can work with to tell that story effectively. But New Zealand is so perfectly poised to tell that story. You haven't embraced all that garbage that the rest of the world has. Uh, you have such an amazing starting point to, to go from. I think, I think there, there are some challenges. You've got to watch the, the overspray and overfurt water quality and some things like that. Um, but by and large, so much more poised from a quality of product standpoint, from a grazing management standpoint, um, from so much of it already being 100% grass fed and grass finished that really allows us to delineate that livestock story back into public perception. We find over and over and over again in consumer research around the globe, people want animal products in their life. They can get past the ethics as long as the animals live a good life. You know, we used to say on, all far, on our old farm, all good days, you know, only one bad at the most is just like the end day, but all good days is what we're looking for uh, as our target. And consumers really connect that 
uh, and then they want that environmental impact. If they can rebuttal things like the China study, uh, forks over knives, things that have told them this is bad for you, we're seeing more and more people get in that paleo, primal, carnivore space that's really embracing animals as part of the heritage of humanity and a strong part of a healthy diet. They don't know what to say to the environmental impact piece. If we as a collective, as a movement, can make that easier for them, there's so much opportunity to come back in that space and get market share back from these folks like Beyond Burger and Impossible that are, that are trying to take that away. But such a myopic piece of how they're approaching that, it's such a reductionist way of how they're uh, approaching both environmental impact, which theirs is so much worse than even the worst of animal agriculture, and, uh, and, and, and um, even the ethical piece I think we can do better on. So um, I say you guys are, are really poised to take advantage acknowledge that, come together, and, and think about how to embrace an outcome-based verification. And, and ecological outcome verification is the only one currently globally to help tell that story more effectively, get that target off livestock's back, uh, and move back into those sectors and get that market share and those premiums back. Great, Great introduction, Chris. Your, your um, enthusiasm is always infectious. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, just admire what you guys have done. And obviously, it's, you're proud to be a part of it as well. And how we can roll this out from for New Zealand's benefit. And thank everybody for, for coming along. And again, apologies for a bit of disruption at the start, but um, we will follow this up with some more. I'd quite like to get maybe Chris back on and dive a little bit more into EOV and Matter Market, how they fit together and some of the specifics about what we're doing and what, how that works. Um, but no, great, great session, Chris, and, and really, really appreciate your time. And uh, thanks to all for coming along. Likewise, yeah, look forward to doing it again soon and open those borders so I can come back. <laughs> okay, Chris. Cheers. All right. Bye, guys. Cheers.